Hello friends! Do you want to elevate your cannabis brand or product? Let's get real, standing out in the cannabis industry isn't a walk in the park. That's where Green Lane Communication comes in. They're not just a cannabis focused PR firm, they're your partners in getting genuine, valuable coverage. From features in major publications, to shout outs in niche blogs and podcasts. Hey, like this one, Cannabinoid Connect. But Green Lane Communication isn't just about making headlines, they're about building your narrative, crafting messages that speak directly to your audience, and creating robust media strategies that hit the mark. Whether you're just starting out or you're a seasoned player in the cannabis game, they've got the chops to amplify your presence. As we gear up for conference season and head into Q4, there's no better time to boost your brand's trust and credibility. Ready to make waves in the cannabis world? Reach out to Green Lane Communication. Check out their offerings at greenlanecommunication.com or find the link right in our episode description. Let's elevate your cannabis journey together with Green Lane communication. Three, two, one, lift off. Cannabinoid Connect, the nation's most diverse cannabis related podcast. And we are officially recording. Jeremy Burke, welcome back to the podcast. Well, uh, great to have you. Yeah, good to be back on, Kevin. I appreciate you uh, tapping me for this. Yeah, I I reached out because your name actually got dropped in a previous episode with Hirsch Jan. Um, you know, we were talking about his recent article, what herbals collapse means the future of the cannabis industry overall and policy. And so he published, I think, through Cultivated News, which is your publication now, right? Yeah, 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 you know, absolutely. Yeah, Hirsch, Hirsch wrote a really good piece. Um, and that's like a big part of what I'm trying to do with Cultivated is that you know, I want smart people like Hirsch to to write about what they see in the industry and, and you know, provide some actionable solutions without finger pointing, right? Um, if you follow the cannabis conversation on LinkedIn and Twitter, social media more generally, there's a lot of finger pointing, a lot of back and forth. And I want to sort of go right down the middle and say, like, here are the facts and, and here's the takeaways. Um, and so I thought he did a really great job with that. He did. Yeah. And he's so articulate, too, when he comes on to actually, you know, convey his message verbally as well. And I got to give you kudos, Jeremy. I mean, what you're doing at Cultivated News, it's it's awesome. I mean, I'm I'm a subscriber on Substack. I enjoy the updates. I think they're daily at this point, if not every other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm working. I Well, not quite daily. I'm working towards daily. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting close. Like I, you know, three times a week or so um, is about the cadence right now. Um, but yeah, I'm looking to move it to a daily. Um, it's just, you know, it's pretty hard to uh, manage as you're familiar with, like getting all that content out and, and it's a grind, but uh, we're, we're slowly stepwise getting there for sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, and last point on Cultivated, and then we'll, of course, jump into the, the various topics we have covered, especially as it comes to cannabis reform at the federal level. But, um, you know, with Cultivated, was that kind of your main drive? You, you mentioned just, you know, when we first started that there was kind of just going right through the middle, kind of, you know, lessening the noise in, in my own words. But, um, you know, the back and forth, is that kind of really the, the drive behind Cultivated or were there other reasons why you started it? It's absolutely a major piece behind Cultivated going straight down the middle. I mean, I think... Um... You know, whether that is the main reason, I don't know, but it's a very important reason, right? Uh, you know, I think some of the other reasons are I've just found cannabis coverage to be pretty fragmented and disjointed. Um, you know, I have a lot of very good competitors and, and there's very good reporters covering the space. Um, but, you know, a lot of the trade publications basically exist to, to you know, sell event tickets. Um, and that impacts the coverage in, in ways that I think aren't very useful. Um, so my idea was to be super independent, beholden to no one and be able to call things both as I see them and the people I platform to publish, see them. Um, that doesn't mean that I want everyone to agree with my takes or that I, even I agree with all the takes I publish um, from other writers, but it does mean that everything is super factual and uh, in no one's pocket. And that's, that's very, very important to me. And I think the cannabis industry, um, like any emerging industry just demands that smart factual coverage that, you know, I hope to provide. So you know, I'm glad you're seeing that in it. And I just hope to do better and better as I go on. Yeah. Well, no, I definitely am a fan. Like I mentioned earlier, I look forward to just watching it progress and grow from here, Jeremy, because you obviously have the experience and, uh, you know, the expertise to to do something like that. So 
with that, let's kind of shift gears and let's talk about first and foremost, the elephant in the room, which is HHS's recent recommendation of reclassifying cannabis within the Controlled Substances Act from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3, right? And there's numerous, I guess, implications that I want to talk with you about today. I think that you've even covered within your publication. And the first is kind of the most kind of glaring and obvious, and that's the tax implications, right? So what are some of the potential financial benefits for cannabis companies after uh, the removal of 280E, for instance, right? For those that aren't aware, and maybe um, talk about some investor sentiment as well. Like what, how has this impacted the stock market and kind of what investors are seeing? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of people kind of discussing what they think will happen with this move to schedule three. And, you know, I want to caveat my answer, right? That this is not a done deal. The DEA still has to rule. There is a small chance, I believe, that they may push back and change things. Um, but I think, you know, it's 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 very likely that this will be the framework. So, you know, uh, uh, under that and, and understanding that, the biggest pieces of this to me are federal tax relief and investor sentiment, as you said, right? Um, 280E is basically a tax that says companies that traffic uh, or sell a Schedule One substance like cannabis is can't deduct any of their business expenses like any other small business can. Um, Now, this affects mostly smaller dispensaries more than it affects MSOs, but everyone in the industry at some point is affected by 280E, no matter where you are on the supply chain. Um, Moving to Schedule 3, right? 280E, by definition, applies to Schedule 1 and 2 drugs. So moving to Schedule 3 will just completely remove that. Um, That's a huge boost to margins for cannabis companies in the first place. Now, you know, it's likely from people who are a little bit closer to the policy uh, than me tell me that, you know, the federal government may replace that with some sort of excise tax, like they don't want to get rid of all the tax revenue entirely. But the moral of the story is that there will be a lot of tax relief and a lot of cannabis companies will look, at least on their balance sheets, a lot more profitable um, as soon as this change does happen. So that's the biggest piece. The second biggest piece is a little bit amorphous. It's investor sentiment, right? Um, Cannabis companies, as you're familiar with, don't necessarily trade on any sort of underlying fundamentals of the business. Um, A lot of these businesses have pretty strong challenges. And if you look at any of the sort of accounting ratios or whatever that most investors look for in the market, um, a lot of them won't be sort of good investments on paper. But what they do trade in is sort of hype and, and these regulatory catalysts. And this is perhaps the biggest regulatory catalyst that I've seen in my career covering the cannabis industry. Now, while it seems incremental to those outside of it, Um, It's actually a very, very big deal. It's really the federal government saying, hey, look, the framework that cannabis companies operate under isn't tenable. We have to do something. And so here is what we're doing. It's not full legalization, but it's a big, big change. And you saw investors start to pour into the industry, right? Um, You know, some cannabis stocks, like right on the day of the announcement, shot up over 20%. There's trading calls. um, MSOS, which is an ETF that tracks a basket of cannabis stocks, has had you know, a pretty good couple of weeks since that day. And so I think you're starting to see, you know, the return of investor interest uh, into the sector based on this catalyst to use kind of like the business speak term. Um, so I think, you know, that's a good thing, right? Like the fact that people are paying attention, the fact that capital is going to flow into the space is really good and really useful for these companies. And you're seeing, you know, a lot of the bigger cannabis companies immediately do capital raises to sort of cash in on this hype and, um, you know, start to put that money to work and, and you know, some of the longer term things they want to do. Um, so, you know, all that is very good for the space. Um, and the last piece I'll say on that is that, look, like you have institutional investors, you know, bigger pension funds or, or, you know, hedge funds backed by big pension funds that probably won't touch a schedule one drug, right? But schedule three, you know, now their interest is peaked, right? Their ears are perking up and they're saying, you know, hey, look, we could develop a strategy around this. Um, and so, you know, I'm having a lot of conversations with a lot of, you know, bigger name funds and and bigger name banks who are sort of getting reinvigorated on the space. Um, You know, all that being said, I don't think we're going to return to 2018, 2019, when, you know, cannabis was on CNBC every single day. Um, But maybe that's a good thing. Like maybe there's a little bit more hype and the fact that, uh, you know, some of the quick, quick money people have moved out and people that are in this for the long term are, are coming back to the sector. I think that's a really good thing. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, any relief from the tax burdens that are currently in place is a huge win, right? And key increased cash flow, more access to capital. I mean, all that is good. Also, from my understanding, you know, there will likely be a, a surge in cannabis research, right? There'll be with this this change. Talk to yeah, me about absolutely. that. Yeah, um, absolutely. And and you know, I think research on all fronts, right? Not just medical research, um, like pharmaceutical mm -hmm. trials, but also just you know, academics who are trying to study the public health impacts of legalization, um, people looking at, you know, tax reform, legal scholars trying to figure out what's going to happen next. Like, the Band-Aid has been ripped off. And now, you know, federal grants for cannabis funding will open up in ways that we've never seen before. So, you know, I'm predicting an explosion of research from all these different fields, which I think is a really good thing. Because, you know, as I've written about, right, like cannabis, there are risks associated with legalization, like we, we should be well aware of those. And oftentimes, um, you know, both legalization advocates and opponents don't necessarily traffic in fact, it's it's a lot of hyperbole. And now we finally have the ability to research some of these claims, test them and really understand how to legalize cannabis in a way that makes sense and is right for the most people. Um, and that extends to things like social equity as well. Like, are these social equity programs actually working? You know, do we have academics and scientists studying these and doing hypothesis testing and looking at data? Um, to really understand these things? Or are we just sort of, you know, getting blown by the wind in terms of uh, what people think or how they feel on a given day? Um, so I think the explosion of research is a very, very good thing. And it's a very good knock on effect that we move to schedule three uh, in all different fields, for sure. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious. I know Israel is a leader when it comes to cannabis research globally, right? They're, they're years ahead. And a big part of the reason is because they allow for human test trials, right, with with cannabis. So moving to Schedule 3, will that open the door for human trial studies or um, are we still kind of hindered in that way? Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't explicitly do so, um, but it, it absolutely could. Right. Uh, we're, we're now in a world where cannabis based drugs could undergo the proper clinical trial method. Um, and oftentimes, you know, human trials are a few steps down the line, right? Um, it, it, especially in, in US pharmaceuticals, but um, it absolutely there is a world where, uh, you know, cannabis based drugs will undergo these clinical trials. Now, you know, I, I don't know enough to say whether big pharmaceutical companies are racing to do this clinical trials are very expensive. Um, and, you know, I think there's less money in sort of reformulating natural products into pharmaceutical drugs uh, because they're, it's difficult to patent, it's difficult to protect. And so, you know, I, I have no sort of inside information as to whether um, we will see more cannabis-based drugs. There already are a few um, who, that, are, that are derived synthetically. Um, but at the same time, it absolutely does open up the possibility that uh, that will happen. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about how rescheduling will impact uh, the state by state approach to cannabis legalization and interstate commerce. Yeah, this is very much I think it's I'm, I'm a little bit nerdy, but I think this is very much <laughs> a very interesting question. And it's an open question, right? Mm -hmm. um, we don't really know. And there's a lot of different opinions on what will happen with legalization. And, and I say legalization, recreational legalization under Schedule 3, right? Um, because Schedule 3 still isn't a recreational category, right? It's a medical category. And so there is a world, like some people have told me, that there is a world in which um, medical cannabis can be transported across state lines. Um, it can maybe even be dispensed in pharmacies behind the counter, uh, like CVS in a state that doesn't have legal cannabis could theoretically sell a Schedule 3 drug. It's like codeine is a Schedule 3 drug that's in a lot of over-the-counter cough syrups. Right. Xanax um, is too, I think. Yeah. Xanax. Yeah, exactly right. Like these are sort of widely used drugs um, that are, you know, pretty easy to get with a prescription. And that's that's sort of like the key, the key part there. Um, in terms of what it'll do to the recreational industry, you know, the jury is still out. And I don't mean to equivocate on the answer. I'll just say this, that like, you know, it's unlikely that it'll provide you know, freedom for cannabis companies to operate with impunity, right? Um, these are still going to be regulated and governed by state laws. There will still be states that have not legalized recreational cannabis. Um, and it'll be up to local jurisdictions to say 
whether or not they're going to penalize people or, or prosecute people even for selling and using cannabis. Um, thinking about, you know, red states that, that don't have legal cannabis, for instance. AKA um, Texas. <laughs> exactly right. No, no, exactly right. Um, and so, so it's a really interesting question. And I think there's a lot of wiggle room here and there's a lot of people who don't really understand what's going to happen next. And I'm not entirely sure that the HHS really understands it's going to happen next. I mean, this is sort of an area of legal scholarship that I think is really cutting edge and, and really interesting right now. Um, the last thing I'll say about this is, you know, I'm sure the DOJ is thinking about this, right? Um, and so, you know, the Attorney General Merrick Garland may release some sort of memo saying, like, here's what's allowed, here's what's not allowed, and here's how we're going to treat this. And then that will be the clarity that's needed to say, like, okay, you know, you can have cannabis cross state lines or, or whatever it may be. But as of right now, it's absolutely not enough protection, but it's really an open question to see where this all goes. Yeah, it's fascinating time. I mean, we're living right through it, too. And you're on the front lines. I mean, <laughs> you know, reporting on it every day, which has got to be exciting and crazy and hectic all at the same time, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But look, these are these are good good problems for a reporter to have, right? Like the right. fact that I don't know the answers to questions, it's, it's invigorating, <laughs> it's exciting, you know, and, and like there's never, never a dull moment. There's always too much to cover, always too many smart people to talk to and ask questions to. So, you know, I love it. And like, you know, frankly, um, you know, the beat was getting a little dry when things weren't happening. And I was you know, starting to think about like, what else can I do? And now all of a sudden, like that's done a full 180 and it's, <laughs> it's, it's exciting again. It's really, really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and the last thing I guess we should touch on uh, in terms of the topic of rescheduling cannabis at the federal level is, you know, the other elephant in the room, which is the social justice concerns, right? Yeah. The, the risks of rescheduling to schedule three um, when it, when it doesn't include any type of, you know, prison reform or um getting these these people out of jail who have been convicted for cannabis related offenses um talk to me a little bit about that and kind of what you're hearing yeah look i mean that's a serious risk the fact that schedule three does not really do anything at all about social justice and social equity right um, i've written pretty widely about this that you know there are a lot of advocates who were pretty angry over the schedule three shift and and you know i think they're right to be very angry um you know, there is a risk that the federal government, that Congress, that Democrats especially say, look, like we've done our part, cannabis is rescheduled, and there's not much incentive to do more. And so I think that a lot of advocates said, if you if we don't get this done at the beginning, it'll never happen. That's a very real risk. And I don't want to be pessimistic, but they're absolutely correct in, in, in that point of view. You know, at the same time, we always have to deal with what is real and not what's ideal. Um, and I think when you look at how Republicans view cannabis and view the issue of cannabis legalization, they are so far apart from social equity advocates, right? right? <clears throat> um, right. And, and we have to deal with the reality of that. Like you can just read, you know, Senator James Lankford just released a letter signed by eight Republicans, uh, you know, pushing back against cannabis being rescheduled. And, you know, it's basically a reefer madness letter. Um, you know, he's clearly very uneducated on the topic. And uh, they don't really know what they're talking about. And, and they, they're sort of trafficking in these easily and widely debunked claims. But knowing that that's who you're negotiating against, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. I, I don't know if, uh, you know, we can ask for a whole lot more. Um, you know, at the same time, right, I, I don't want to sweep their concerns under the rug because these are crucially important as we're dealing with the creation of a brand new sector and we're dealing with the market structure from the very beginning, right? Um, policy is a lot easier to start than it is to change once it's already started. I think I, you know, use the metaphor like changing a cruise ship on a dime um, when talking about it. It's like, it's very, very hard to retroactively do that. And there's a lot of people who have spent a lot of time in the trenches trying to advocate for reform on those terms. And none of us and none of this would be possible without them. And so I think we really need to understand their concerns and figure out how to work them in in ways that are realistic and not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. I mean, you're, you're speaking to one side that is so far behind in, you know, the push for reform and kind of even understanding the history of yeah. where we're at, you know? So um, it's, it's kind of just a mixture of just working together and providing that education and trying to meet in the middle. So I totally understand on the same topic of, of cannabis uh, federal reform, you know, they also announced that a key Senate committee is officially scheduling uh, a vote for safe banking on September 27th. 
Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, look, I mean, <laughs> you know, I'll say two things about the Safe Banking Act. The first thing I'll say, and, and I'll wear my optimistic hat, is this time actually does feel a little bit different uh, than the <laughs> previous times that they've tried to pass it. Now, putting on my pessimist hat, uh, you know, they've tried to pass the Safe Banking Act nine times before. Uh, and how and how lot. long of a time span? Nine, nine times, uh, like, within yeah, what duration? 20... Uh, 2017 i believe 2018 so about five years um okay. they've tried i need to i need to double check but i believe the first time it actually passed the house was like mid 2018 i do have to fact check that um but it, it, it's it's a bit of a crazy situation where um the bill is something that absolutely can get passed it is in its simplest rawest form it's very palatable for the Republicans we just discussed. Um, and it also, you know, there is a clear reason why social equity advocates would support it, right? The cash only business is good for no one. Opening up the banking right. sector is really good for the small businesses and minority entrepreneurs they want to support. Um, at the same time, you know, there's a sense that maybe the bill just doesn't really work. Uh, you know, and that's, again, me being a pessimist is not my opinion. Um, I'll, I'll sort of make the pessimistic argument that, you know, a narrow banking bill makes no one really happy. Um, and under Schedule 3, there may not be a reason for it in the first place. Now, right. you know, I don't really think that's true. I think that, um, you know, there does need to be congressional action. Like Congress does ultimately need to lead the charge on what cannabis is going to look like because laws are a lot harder to change than executive fiat. Um, but at the same time, right, like, lawmakers are walking a tightrope with this bill for every little piece of social equity that Democrats want to include, you lose a Republican. Um, and even for Republicans, many of them who will vote for this bill do not support legalization in the slightest and don't even like cannabis or cannabis users in the first place. Um, you know, I think, you know, there is Senator Tommy Tuberville of Alabama who wanted to be a signatory on the bill and ultimately, you know, his conservative base in Alabama push back to the point where he, he just couldn't do it. It was just politically unpalatable for him to do so. And so, you know, that's, again, the framework we're working under. Now, there's there's a reality in which this bill does pass. I think the Senate is, senators are pretty confident that it will pass the Senate. The House is a different story. Um, but it, it's kind of a bill that that may work and also may make no one happy in the first place. <laughs> and so that's sort of an odd position to be in, for sure. Right. And like you said, I mean, if that rescheduling does happen, I mean, it's kind of null and void at that point. It, it really doesn't matter. Yeah, I, you know, I actually, I, I wouldn't go that far. And I'll sort of like restate what I said. I think I think there is that line of thinking uh, that it's null and void, but I, I'm not sure it actually is. I think ultimately, you know, Congress should lead the charge and, and codify this into law. Um, and I think a lot of lawyers and regulators are still unclear as to what Schedule 3 really will do for recreational cannabis sellers specifically. Gotcha. Um, and then whether even banks and payment providers and all the things that safe banking acts addresses will even have the bandwidth or ability to sort of understand that nuance and work where they can like there really needs to be you know a very clear thing and, and congress needs to lead the charge on that um now you know again like under schedule three banks could decide to work on things in a case-by-case -case way um but you know the juice has to be worth the squeeze and the money has to be there and and we all know that uh you know the industry is volatile and i'm not sure that you can count on that Right, right. No, absolutely. Well, hey, I mean, as we kind of wrap up, I want to discuss a few more topics that you've been covering within Cultivated News. One is New York's cannabis rollout. I mean, I've gotten yeah. a lot of different <laughs> perspectives and opinions on this podcast, as you can imagine. Um, what have you reported on and kind of what have been some of the things that have really stood out to you within this whole process? Yeah, look, New York's cannabis rollout has been extremely messy, as I've written about. Um, and I think it is symptomatic of when good ideals meets poor execution meets reality. Um, and, and what I mean by that is New York has really tried to learn from what other states are doing and has tried to do something different. They, they tried to say, look, cannabis specifically, we're going to use cannabis legalization specifically as a tool to repair the harms in the war on drugs. We, we care a lot less about this being an investable sector. We care a lot less about this being a, a, an industry we support. 
Uh, and even we care a little bit less about tax revenue. We, we're we're going to prioritize everything around people who have been harmed by the war on drugs getting access to economic opportunity. They said that this could be a generational wealth creating opportunity for you know mostly black and brown people who have been either previously arrested for cannabis or from zip codes that have been heavily persecuted for cannabis use and cannabis sale. Um, so look, like, you know, putting my cards on the table, I agree with that standpoint. I think that's a huge role of cannabis legalization. But at the same time, um, the rollout has been sued to oblivion by all sides. Um, I think there are a lot of people who invest in cannabis companies or who are in cannabis companies who say it's unfair for regulators to pick a special class of people to access the industry first. Um, and there's been a huge fight about it. And I see this fight as sort of a microcosm of what, you know, we are all discussing in society right now. Um, you know, capitalism, fairness, social equity, more broadly, like these are issues that are going to be very pertinent in the election. And New York's cannabis rollout is symptomatic of all of that. Um, you know, there is a world in which regulators in New York, and I don't want to sort of point fingers, but there's a world in which they would have executed a little bit better. And these arguments would have been a little bit less raw and emotional, I think, on either sides, because the industry would be stood up. But the reality is, is that, you know, we're over two years into legalization. And there's like five stores open in New York City, which has millions and millions of people like it's it's a pretty, uh, you know, <laughs> it's a it's, it's pretty much a sign of it being a failure to launch, right? Five and, legal and think, stores, right? Five legal stores in like, five, sorry, five legal stores. 1300, about, think, you know, yes, illegal bodegas. 1400. And, I've seen 1400, on the recent yeah. estimates. So yeah, yeah, I mean, no, it's just like, it's just the numbers just going up and up and up. And, 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 you know, I think that's, that's not a recipe for anyone to win. I mean, I think these minority entrepreneurs are not going to be able to compete with an untaxed market. Um, you know, big companies who could actually make a dent in this, right? Like they have the capacity to supply the market um, now, you know, have a sore taste in their mouth. And, um, you know, at the same time, it's like people on the ground, like here in Brooklyn, where I live, like really don't like these big companies at the same time. So, you know, the well has been poisoned, I think, for everyone. And it's going to take a lot of digging to fix these problems that, you know, didn't really need to be created in the first place, in, in my point of view. Two years, five stores. So what what else in the current state is happening? I mean, like are are licenses being issued? Like are they are they pass like what are they doing? Yeah. So no. yeah, licenses are being issued. I mean, I think they're sort of scrambling to correct these things. Um, you know, they they had uh not to get sort of too into the nitty gritty, but they the first class of licenses was was people who were either had cannabis convictions or were related to people with cannabis convictions. Um and that was a pretty small group of people. Ultimately, it was very hard. There was there's a lot of like, you know, interagency politicking in the state. Um, and ultimately, it's very hard for many of these people to get stores open. And without things like the Safe Banking Act, many of them couldn't really get loans, they couldn't get access to capital to really start these businesses in the way any other small business owner could. So there's just structural problems for this program from the very beginning that, that could have been predicted. Um, you know, the second piece of that is that on October 4th, uh, you know, the New York, the OCM, the cannabis regulators have said they'll open up licenses to everyone. So now the big MSOs will actually be able to come into the state and they'll be able to open up stores after October 4th. Like once they, you know, take some time, but once the licensing is open, it's sort of going to be more of a free for all. And I don't want to say a free for all because it's not, but more of a free for all than it would be. Um, and so, you know, I think I do think things will change fast, right? Like in three years, a lot of this could be a moot point. Um, but it's going to take a lot of pain to get there. And that pain was unnecessary. Right. Right. Yep. Well, let's, let's also talk about, you've, you've taught, you've discussed um, broad, broader policy, drug policy reform. So uh, one piece I think you covered was the de decriminalization of opioids, which to me is wild. So what's, what's your take on that proposed legislation and kind of where are you seeing it headed right now? Where's it at? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I drew the allusion to broader drug policy reform, um, not because I necessarily am advocating for it, but I think it's all part of a broader basket of what a lot of these reform advocates want. Um, and that, I think that's an important distinction, right? It's like there are like cannabis is only one drug. It's, it's perhaps the most widely used drug. But I think a lot of people put all their eggs in this cannabis basket and said, like, hey, look, like cannabis can be the tip of the spear for all this police reform and all these things, but really it's one drug, right? Um, if you really want to reform policing in America, uh, I think 
we're going to have to have difficult conversations about legalizing all drugs. Um, and, and, you know, that doesn't mean that these should be marketed products. It just means decriminalization coupled with the safe supply, I think would go a long way into doing these things. Um, you know, and ultimately, like the point is, is that if you assume that, okay, if we legalize cannabis, you know, we're, we're done with, with police reform and social justice issues, I think that's a really kind of unfair thing to put on cannabis legalization. Um, right. And ultimately, it's a recipe for failure on both sides. Now, with opioids in particular, I think that's that's sort of an interesting issue, because a lot of these are prescription drugs, right? It's not about them being legal, or illegal. It's about abuse under a prescription regime. And that's absolutely something that can happen no right. matter what drug it is. And so, you know, I think I think we, there's a lot of nuance there. We need to be very careful about what we say, um, you know, and at the end of the day, it's like, you know, do I think drugs like cocaine should be marketed products? Like, no, probably not. Um, but you can't decriminalize cocaine without offering a safe supply because there's a chicken or egg question there that'll never get solved. And so um, the moral of the story is just these are broader conversations to have about police reform and drug legalization that I think are all interrelated. And I think cannabis is really just the start. Is there, I mean, is there any movement outside of cannabis? I mean, we're seeing it on, in the psychedelics realm, right? With psilocybin and and other things that are really taking the path on more of the medical, you know, pathway. Um, cannabis is really fighting the recreation yeah. and medical fight. So are you seeing any other substances that are, that are gaining traction in this broader drug policy reform discussion? <laughs> You know, I, th I think you kind of nailed it, Kevin, like, you know, psychedelics are a little bit different because yes, like while there, there is a sort of small grassroots movement to say like shrooms should be legal and you, you know, you're starting to see sort of like branded illegal, but, but branded mushroom chocolate bars and things like that are becoming very popular. Um, mostly these are sort of FDA approved drugs that people are seeking to legalize. Like those are going to go through clinical trials. Um, it's going to be sort of biotechs and big pharmaceutical companies who ultimately bring those drugs to market. It's not going to be like, you know, branded pre-rolled joints, although, you know, I could be very wrong and, and, and that could be the case. Um, so no, like I, I don't see the same movement in terms of recreational drugs, but you know, there are a lot of advocacy groups, drug policy Alliance, um, students for sensible drug policy that do say like, we, we do need to think more broadly about decriminalization and not legalization for other drugs for sure. Um, but many of those groups are not advocating for, you know, having like cocaine dispensaries in Brooklyn, you know, I'll, I'll definitely, they're definitely <laughs> drawing a line, you know, far before that, which is probably the right framework to think about it under. Right. Right. You know, makes total sense. Well, Jeremy, I've really enjoyed talking with you. I, I wanted to bring one thing up before we go here and I, yeah. I follow you on Twitter and I know that you have a tweet pinned about your friend, Evan Gershkovich. Is that how I pronounce yes. his name? Yes. Um, yeah. And I've seen posts about this reporter, uh, this journalist as well on LinkedIn. I mean, why don't you want to go ahead and just maybe share a little, you know, insight as to what's going on with Evan currently in Moscow and, and just, you know, where just generate awareness for him in that way. Yeah, no, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to your audience about Evan. Um, you know, Evan's one of my closest friends from college. He was my roommate when we both started our careers in journalism. Um, he is a Wall Street Journal reporter who is doing, you know, what I'll, I'll call earth shattering coverage about the Ukraine war, um, about how Putin and the Kremlin has sort of started to cut russia off and isolate russians from the rest of the world and the broader economy um and he was captured on on march 29th um you know under the auspices of spying for the u.s which uh is actually it's actually illegal for the u.s to use foreign correspondence and spies so these are you know bs charges and he's been in confinement um since march 29th and uh he will be in confinement it is called pre-trial detention until at least november 30th um, and ultimately, what my role is in this is to advocate for the U.S. federal government to do everything they can to bring an innocent reporter home. Um, and so I'd encourage everyone to learn more. Um, you can go to freeevangershkovich.com to learn more, to write him letters, keep his spirits up. Um, and, and, you know, even if you're so inspired, write to your congressman and tell him that uh, this is an injustice and that we would need to bring Evan home immediately. Absolutely. No, I appreciate you sharing that, Jeremy. We need to free Evan for sure. And uh, like you said, the websites that, that you listed, if you guys want to go on there and learn more about it and and uh, even reach out, it'd be, it'd be really helpful and beneficial. So Jeremy, is there anything you want to leave the audience with before we go, man? 
Yeah, on a lighter note, uh, subscribe to Cultivated. Cultivated.news, <laughs> you can enter email in. Um, would love to have your audience reading and letting me know what you think and, and giving me story ideas because, you know, a journalist is only as good as the readers and sources. And so I would encourage everyone to subscribe and uh, let's start a dialogue. Absolutely. It's so worth it, guys. You get really good insight from Jeremy and the rest of these uh, really talented writers and journalists that are that are covering these on the front lines, all these stories throughout the day and week. So, Jeremy, thanks again, man. Let's have you on again real soon. I'm sure that things are going to develop every day. Things are new. So, Absolutely. Yeah, it's never, never a dull moment, Kevin. And uh, yeah, love to do it again. Appreciate the time. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you all for listening. Bye. Cannabinoid Connect, the nation's most diverse cannabis-related podcast.